Hey, welcome everybody to uh, our next instalment of the One Church podcast. And uh, I'm your host, Michael Williams, here with my good friend, Nathan Jordan. Hi, Nathan. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you, Michael Williams. Good to have you with us today. Yeah. yeah. Are you still uh, <laughs> watching Married Blind? Married at First Sight? Married at First Sight. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Uh, um, uh, my wife likes to watch it and uh, yeah, I like my wife. Okay. So. Uh, to, to maintain a healthy marriage, yeah. we watch him married at first sight, which is it ironic. Did. Yeah, yeah, it, it works. It works. Great. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hey, great to have a conversation with about something quite deep, actually, today, quite big, um, yes. but also really common, actually, in, yeah. in Christianity, which is this idea of of deconstruction. So um, we'll jump right in and say, hey, Nate, what is deconstruction? Can you tell us what that is, just so our listeners got a kind of yeah. real feel for what we're talking about here today? Sure. I want to take you, Mike, back to 20th century France, where a young philosopher... <laughs> no, um, the, 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 the term uh, deconstruction was coined by a philosopher, French philosopher, called Derrida, Jacques Derrida, in the 20th century. And he was primarily interested in, in text and linguistics. Um, and the philosophy really seeks to challenge definitions within language and text and seek to uh, identify and out any subsequent hierarchies found within. So it's within linguistics, that's really where the uh, true deconstruction lies. But he would he would apply this field of study. So if you read Derrida, and he's famously really hard to read, so you, you read his writings, and he sort of goes here, there, and everywhere, uh, philosophizing about this, that, and the other, like a, a brilliant mind. And so he applied the philosophy of deconstruction, deconstruction to, to everything. To, to our understanding of words, language, text, religion. So for Derrida, you could deconstruct anything from uh, a table to uh, Marxism to God. And, and he would, and he would write about it and espouse this view. So that, that's like deconstruction in a nutshell. And it's quite actually, it's, it, it's, it's a little hard to pin down exactly what he was talking about in a, in a very strict definition. He was often quite reluctant to define it too. Uh, and that's really the nature of the philosophy uh, when you look into it. Um, but within, you alluded to there, within a Christian context, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the original philosophy in terms of its criticism of definition or linguistics or um, citation and things like Derrida originally used it for. But within a Christian context, context, when someone says they're deconstructing, what that tends to mean at the moment, and as you said, it's quite a popular thing, going on and, and we're hearing that term more and more within the Christian world what that tends to mean is someone deconstructing their faith is is questioning their faith that's that person would deconstruct by questioning their faith and perhaps like pulling parts of it which they've just believed for a while pulling it apart questioning why do I believe that why do I do that um, what does that mean um, and deconstructing can take on like many different forms for people um, from just challenging and maybe engaging critically with certain ideas and changing some certain aspects of their belief right through to, and this would be maybe typical of someone that says, hey, I've deconstructed, through to just abandoning the entirety of their faith. Um, and that, that that can be quite a process, I think, for a person to go through. If, if you have something so important and integral as, as a faith, a Christian faith or a worldview, to deconstruct it... Mm is quite a fundamental change in how you see the world, how you think, and especially if you deconstruct it in its entirety and then, then uh, are left with nothing there in the, instead of the faith or or would then construct something different in its place. But there it is in a nutshell, Okay, so, deconstruction. So let me put it back to you then that deconstruction is a kind of a, 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 almost like quite a hardcore version of critical evaluation. It's taking yeah. something and pulling it apart, Yeah. Criti critically analysing the the very construction of that idea yes how that idea came about that's right where it comes from mm -hmm. yeah and so if you apply that in a faith context yep. we're going back to perhaps core teachings of christianity that have been around for a couple of thousand years yeah. and we're deconstructing them we're trying to pull them apart and find out hopefully find out what what in that is true what in that is just yes um maybe a negative thing yeah, okay. that's it. So, I, so are you for or against deconstruction? Is it a good thing inherently? Is it a bad thing? Is it somewhere in the middle? Yes and no. <laughs> With nuance, I think. Um, again, because th this thing is so broad um, and you can apply it to so many different areas and, and in engage with deconstruction in so many different ways. So it was okay. I, what I'll do, I'll start by saying why it's a good thing. Yeah, And sure. why I think 
so you and I, we're, we're Christians. Uh, why I think we should engage with deconstruction. So for me, the benefits of it, and use the word critical thought, critical engagement, what engaging with deconstruction does for me is that if you are continually looking to deconstruct your beliefs, your worldview, to question and challenge uh, why it is you think the way that you think, uh, why do I believe that about the world or about God or why do I practice my faith in this way? Um, what continually asking those questions could ensure is a mitigation against um, false views or erroneous or faulty thinking. Mm. Um, sometimes we just we just believe things mm. because well, that's what that's what we were told. Uh, I don't know when did you stop believing in Santa? Mm. Yeah, uh, he's not real. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. uh, a, a Christmas Eve service. I, I conducted a Christmas Eve service and this was like 11 p.m. at night. And for some reason, I just, this is late, I didn't think families were in there. And I made a, it wasn't, it wasn't in my notes, I made a throwaway comment about basically saying Santa wasn't real. And then like oh, there gosh. was just these parents in the middle of the room to their horror were like pointing at their kids. Like, oh, How could gosh. you not see this as I just shattered their world? <laughs> um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a trivial but accurate example of Maybe at one time when we were kids, we would have believed something about a man that would travel the world and give us give us presents at Christmas time, which we then would deconstruct that idea to realise, yeah, that's just something that we tell tell kids. And the same is true of our faith. So we we apply deconstruction now with our conversation just to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we can just pick up ideas or beliefs about God that we never really challenge mm. or think about. Um, and for me, it's always healthy to to know. Why, why it is we believe what we believe? And, and scripture tells us that, doesn't it? In um, uh, 1 Peter, mm. always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. Mm. So can I answer with conviction and clarity why I believe what I believe? Um, or have I just inherited some of my beliefs, maybe from someone else, from what I've heard, and never really challenged them? So Good. what deconstruction can do, and one of the, one of the benefits of it, is it, it can just, it can help us just critically, critically evaluate um, what we believe, why we believe it, and and almost like empower power the in, the individual to to remove parts which either um, don't align with with what we see as truth, with maybe what we read in scripture, um, and and you look back at church history. I would argue that church history is is full of that version of deconstruction, mm. where where a, a practice. Um, or a structure came to be, maybe it started with a good intention, but it, it became something that deviated from, um, I would say, God's original design. And what we watch, so what we see, and, and the Reformation might be a good example of appealing to this, is a moment where um, someone, Martin Luther, challenged what was, mm -hmm. um, deconstructed what was, to usher in a new era for the church. Sure. Um, and, and there's there's many examples where, where that happens. You look at William Wilberforce and what he did uh, in slavery f within within England and then the subsequent um, uh, removal, abolition, that's the word I'm looking for, of, of the slave yeah. trade. Uh, that's deconstructing a view um, because it was challenged and, and like, why, why do we believe that's okay? Um, so that, that's a positive of it. Another positive that's inherent to a deconstructionist view or philosophy is its pursuit of injustice or um, oppression, mm -hmm. um, which for me very much aligns with the Christian faith to, to seek justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. Like That's something that we are called to do is to um, his kingdom come, his will be done. And if there are, in the way that we see things and term things, if there are some um, oppressive um, uh, seeds within, what a deconstructionist pursuit does, it tries to out them. So if I am doing something, thinking something, um, or acting in a way which benefits me and oppresses someone else, um, a deconstructionist view seeks to challenge that. Like, mm. is this fair? Is this right? Is this just? Um, and to deconstruct things um, mm. Uh, oppressive definitions or or actions, um, so so those are some of the benefits. So I so, think. It, so you say it can be healthy for uh, a regular pew dwelling Christian yeah. to adopt a critical mindset when it comes to the things they're being taught or the things they're hearing, so yeah. they can get a better understanding of why 
we teach those things. Yeah. And um, th that puts them in a better position to be able to not just understand their faith, but perhaps answer people's questions and yeah. and, and yeah. so forth. Yeah. And last thing on that, it also stops us stagnating, I think. Yeah. So that if we can commit, so the individual uh, Christ follower, believe it, if we can commit to an ongoing journey of just challenging um, and and assessing why do I think what do, why what I think why am I acting in the way that I'm acting? Is there anything that I can do to to deconstruct things that are in my life that aren't pleasing to God, that aren't helping others, that aren't helping me? Um, that for me ensures a continual uh, journey of of growth and development um, that that helps us become more Christ-like. You could argue that that mm. that way of thinking helps to remove obstacles, yeah. negativity, um, and, 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 and yeah. Helps before, to before we get onto the negatives, sure. Um, why do you, do you think the church struggles to encourage this? Do you think, why, why do you think this is a, I guess not a common thing in churches? Um, yeah. is there a reason for it? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that there's a number of reasons. Um, and if you look into church history, some are good, some are bad. Some of the bad reasons, um, I, I guess you could term it that way. Um, if you have, it, it, it would be power. Yeah. So Foucault was a, um, a philosopher as well that, mm. that that spoke a lot about power dynamics and things. And if you have the church, the established church, the doctrine, the dogma, the orthodoxy of the church, um, a power dynamic or an oppressive, oppressive dynamic would suggest that any deviation from their teaching or the way that they see it is a negative and and would be um would undermine their power and authority so here's here's the right thing to think here's the right thing to do we'll control the narrative we'll control the doctrine the dogmas the orthodoxy the orthopraxy we'll we'll say what's right and so there's a mm. historically there's probably been a um a resistance to an individual's ability to challenge or deconstruct um because it's it um challenges power um so I wouldn't necessarily say that's a healthy uh, way, uh, means of mm. helping people. That, that's, a, that's a negative. Mm. Um, perhaps a more of a, a positive reason why it's not been encouraged is because it can, if, and we'll, we'll, maybe this segues us into some of the negatives, if handled incorrectly, it can result, I think, in an, an old term, um, what you would um, term as, um, so orthodoxy, what, what's the other word, begins with a H? Uh, <laughs> you put me on the put spot. You on the spot. <laughs> Heresy. Heresy. Yeah. yeah, which is an old-fashioned word. Yeah, sure. Um, and we don't we don't like it much, but heretical views, views that um, aren't actually don't represent the Christian faith or don't represent what Jesus taught, or um, views and uh, practices that are, are different. And when when an individual begins to deconstruct, what can happen is. Um, they begin to deviate from what you would term as orthodox Christianity or the truths of what are in the Bible. And if if handled incorrectly, can can result in, and this is again straying into uh, some of the negatives that I see in, in deconstruction, can result into some damaging areas or destructive tendencies sure. when, when um, perhaps if someone within the church is hurt by what the church has done or has had a negative experience, and then challenges from that place, um, that might not be a healthy process or a healthy endeavor to pursue. Mm. So maybe the church doesn't encourage that for fear of wanting to protect people yeah. uh, and, and keep them within a, a healthy way of, you know, yeah. hey, this is what the Bible teaches. This is uh, this is what well, the Bible says how we should live. And to challenge that too much yeah. um, may result in someone going off on their own in isolation and, or uh, resulting in something destructive in their life. Right, and you could bring disunity and... Just unity, people, division, yeah, division. Yeah. Uh, so, so we want to teach people what to think, but we also want to teach people how to think, and so that's what we're trying to do in a positive yes. sense. Yeah, yeah. So, what are we trying to avoid then? What are some of the negatives? Yeah. So, yeah, th this fascinates me then. So, so for what we've described so far, I think as the positives of deconstruction um, are arguably, and you use the term well, it's arguably critical thinking or um, transformation not necessarily deconstruction mm. as as Derrida at least would say and I think there's a lot of Derrida's philosophy in deconstruction that is congruent with a Christian belief um, you can adopt it and apply it and use it for 
um, to bring out good results, to, to challenge, as I said, to challenge something that would be oppressive or negative hierarchies that we might come up against. There, there are some things, however, that I think are quite dangerous or that don't align with a Christian worldview. So one of the things that Derrida writes his philosophy against, and this is to put it back straight there, one of the things that he really campaigns against is something called logocentrism. So logocentrism is this, this fancy word in a nutshell, as, as he kind of terms it, is the idea that words um, can appertain to truth. Mm -hmm. So Derrida would say, you can deconstruct any word or any definition because any word and definition can be infinitely cited or quoted or taken in different contexts. So therefore, there's no real objective truth in words, in anything that's stated or written. So I know that's quite a, <laughs> a, a broad, so, but, but, but logocentrism is the idea that words and definitions can contain uh, truth, truth, meaning, um, and that they can't be infinitely cited, that potentially there are binary terms, um, which Derrida would, by very nature, call oppressive. Now, I would argue that a Christian worldview aligns with a logocentric worldview sure. that says words, definitions, can relate to truth, that there is objective truth. And, and in fact, for me, so we read in uh, the Gospel of John, John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and by him all things were made. And in Genesis, we see, we see that God, God spoke existence into being. So my view, and we're really getting into it, and I, I love knowing all this <laughs> stuff, my view is that, and again, the Christian view, for me, is a logocentric view. Sure. That the world was made by the very words of God, that truth, reality, meaning um, can be linked to to words, the word of God, the word um, of God that we see in scripture. And so to say, as the deconstructionists would, that any word can be challenged, any definition can be challenged. And if you say that there's a binary term in anything, actually that leads to oppression. For me, that doesn't align with the Christian view. And this is where mm -hmm. it gets quite dangerous. And, and it's a subtle thing mm. um, because if we certainly adopt that view, truth is in the eye of the beholder that just because you say that's true mike doesn't necessarily mean it's true your version of truth is different to my version of truth then actually you end up in relativism you end up just saying well that's your faith is that you know, is yours mm. my faith is mine who's to say what's true who's to say sure. what's right or wrong um and then we become our own arbiters of truth yeah and then we become god yeah because we're not submitting to any of his, not submitting to the ultimate word, the Logos, as we would see in, in the Gospel of John. Yeah. And that's where it becomes dangerous. Sure. And that's what I see when someone begins to deconstruct their faith, they're in danger, I think, of, of challenging logocentrism, taking on the, the journey of saying, let, let me decide now what truth is. Right. I will be the judge of all things true. Um, and then I think you're on icy ground. Icy, icy ground? Yeah, difficult ground, of what, course. What does icy ground mean? Not sure. Yeah, thin ice. <laughs> Slippery. Thin ah, ice. there we yeah, go. Slippery ground. <laughs> I, I'm coming up with a new term. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Derrida's uh, statement or belief itself is self-defeating because he's making a claim on truth by suggesting that. And, and obviously that can be deconstructed. And so you end up in like a... A vacuum, a black hole, really, don't you? If... When you take the philosophy to its extreme, mm. it becomes self-defeating. Sure. Because the philosophy says you you can't make any truth claims with words, yeah. using words. Which is a claim. <laughs> Which is a truth claim. <laughs> On truth. <laughs> so it doesn't actually make sense. Sure. So there, so again, logocentrism makes more sense for us to say, no, that you can say something that's true, that is ultimate truth, based on the truth we would believe of the logos by him, all things were made, Um yeah, and that for me feels like a better worldview to hold to. Sure. So, well, yes but no. what's really helpful about that, Nathan, is what we've seen is that there are there are positives in deconstructionism. Yeah. That you can, as a Christian, um, really critically evaluate the tenets of your faith. Yeah. That that's a good thing. Um, but you want to keep a, a right heart about that, so as not to stray into some of these negative aspects of deconstructionism. Yeah. 
and and the heart is key there, I think, and because mm. I've not really touched on that. Like, why would we want to deconstruct? Mm. Like that that's a good question, I think, to ask. And 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 for me, the worry might be sometimes the motive sure. of that process isn't healthy. Very that, good. For example, if 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 you if I offended you uh, once upon a time in church, and if that was the 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 small stone that started the avalanche of you unraveling all of your faith, the root of that is offence. And if you think, well, those Christians, they're all just like this, therefore I'm going to challenge everything that they do. Um, that for me is not a healthy way of, of beginning to deconstruct anything. And I would advise anyone, if you're, if you're starting to challenge or critically engage with your faith, check your motives, like check your heart in that. Why am I doing this? Why am I challenging this? Yeah. Is, is it to get more of a robust worldview and to uh, fully understand and, be able, and to be able to articulate what I believe and why? Or is it because I'm hurting? Yes. And that's challenging, right, isn't that it? Is. Yeah, is it because I'm offended? Is it because I don't like that preacher or what that church did to me? Um, and that's why I want to pull it apart. Sure. Hmm. So so within Pentecostalism, we believe in the spiritual gifts, one of which is discernment, Yeah. I guess. And there's a sense in which you need discernment when you are listening to people who speak yep. in your church on Sunday or maybe you're listening to a podcast or a YouTube video. What would your advice be to people that are hearing all of these claims on truth, hearing all of these views? They want to be critically aware. How do we get to a place where we can do that yeah. um, without getting deceived, without yeah. losing our discernment, without kind of going off track? What's yeah. your advice to people who are really interested, Yeah. Um, but perhaps on, on some dangerous ground? Good question. If I can circle back to remind me to say this, um, uh, so Augustine has a great way of uh, getting to reason. So we'll, we'll circle back to that one. Okay. Because just just some like good practical advice for me is um, don't do that alone. Sure. Like speak to someone. Like the the internet is full of every opinion under the sun. It is. And and you can go on these deep dives into this definition of truth and this worldview, and you can end up in this kind of plethora of different. Uh, ideologies and the way people think and stuff like that um but but find someone that knows you loves you and begin to just to authentically unpack some things with them um so that would be that'd be one thing um i would say check your heart and check your motive as we've as we said before why am i doing this like why why do i want to challenge this is it because i feel a bit of angst is it because i'm uh, upset or is it because i want to i want to grow want to improve like is it positive or negative in nature um Augustine has this, um, and it's, it's written in Latin, so I would butcher it if I tried. <laughs> uh, but effectively, the, the, the saying is uh, reason through faith. So acquire reason and truth through the lens of faith. And I think the, the society that we live in at the moment, um, that's often flipped. It's um, faith through reason. That if I, can, if I can work and reason my way to some of these truths, then I'll believe. Right. If someone can prove to me that God is real, uh, that that the Bible makes sense and is is the word of God, then I'll believe it. Uh, Augustine, he proposed that the only way you're ever going to get to true, a true understanding of reality and truth as it really is, is faith, uh, reason through faith, faith first. Sure. Um, and Jesus, so always for me has to come back to Jesus. So um, Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, "What is truth?" And you read that account in, in scripture where Jesus is on trial and it's, it's called the, the trial motif in, in the Gospel of John. And there's this, this moment, this dramatic trial where this guy is saying, what even is truth? How do you know what's truth? And he doesn't, he doesn't give Jesus the, the chance to respond. He just kind of says it almost in this, mm. what even is truth? Flippant. Flippant way. The irony being he's asking that to the per, very per, personification of truth. So Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So the incarnation of truth revealed to us is, is in the person of Jesus. And that, for me, is a relationship. So yes, we can acquire knowledge. Yes, we can learn more things. But reason through faith, faith first, starts a connection with, an encounter with, a relationship with Jesus. That then informs everything that I do and see, the, the ideas that I might want to deconstruct my um, the practices, the places I go, the things that I hear that I want to challenge and critically engage with. To come back to your question, if someone wants to do that, if I can remain steadfast with a relationship with Jesus, if that stays um, central to the whole endeavour, then I think it could be uh, 
a healthy thing to engage with. Hmm. If that's removed, then we step in like the Derridian philosophy would <laughs> encourage us to do. We step into an anti logo centric view where, hey, I'm my own God. I can make my own truth. Um, yeah. We're in this relativistic world view of the world. Um, and that, for me, is destructive, uh, not constructive. Very good. A- any books on this subject that can help us, Nick? Lots. <laughs> None come to mind right now. Um, so actually, so the, for me, the, one of the most helpful things that, that really just unlocked something, and it was the uh, Augustine's approach to truth and reason. Sure. That um, was highlighted to me in William Lane Craig's book, Reasonable Faith. Uh, so that's a great place to start, where he just he goes into, covers lots of philosophy, and probably just touches on them. So that's that's really great, um, and that amongst others, which uh, very good. We'll put in the we'll put in the show notes. We can put in the show notes. Yeah. So reasonable faith by William Lane Craig is a good one. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nate. That's been really interesting. I hope you have enjoyed listening to our podcast today, and uh, we will be around for the next one very soon. Take care.